Hi, Wendy. Hi, Jen. I'm Wendy Peterman, and I identify as a visual pattern oriented autistic with selective mutism tendencies. I help neurodiverse women experiencing overwhelm or masking fatigue to relax and feel a sense of belonging through a connection with nature. I have a BA in dance, an MS in soil science, and a PhD in forest engineering. I believe that true resilience for ecological systems, including humans, comes from working with our natural processes and innate potential. In addition to my professional life, I have led a full personal life, raising one biological child and four adopted children. I spend my free time hiking, quilting, and woodworking, and people can see videos of my outdoor adventures on YouTube at Forests of the Soul. Thanks. Wendy, I loved your story. Would you like Thank to you. tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write about this now and what kind of fierce awakening uh, you had and in the sharing of this story? Like, how did you choose this story? Well, I actually it was, you know, we were processing and telling different stories and things like that. And I had a lot of stories that were fun or were interesting or were inspiring or showed a lot of courage just for my career. But the stories themselves, um, you know, while they might be interesting or show a lot of courage, um, it's really what's behind it and how I got there and the fact that it's me doing it. <laughs> Um, you know, with my um, neurodistinctness and my background, um, the fact that I am actually doing those things, that I have accomplished those things is actually pretty remarkable. Um, and I, I hadn't really thought of it before, you know, I was just doing what I was doing and trying to make it in the world and be who I am and um, essentially try not to be seen doing it because um, that usually was dangerous or you know, um, uh, you know, could lead to some interpersonal things that were uncomfortable for me. And, um, and I just got to this place of like, I'm 50 years old. And I've really, really been through a lot and accomplished a lot and learned a lot about myself and self acceptance and self awareness are the most important things along with some emotional intelligence. that I've learned, especially in the last three years, you know, during the pandemic, that um, are helping me. And I think that that could help other people, you know, even just one other person. And I know that in my space, I have mentored a lot of people, especially women and some of them women like me, and they're doing really well in life. And I realized I have, it's not that I need to tell other people how to be, or I can tell other people how they are, but just that sharing my story might be helpful to some other women who are neuroatypical and struggling with, with similar challenges. I think that's so important. And you write about this, like the 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 masking that women are doing, right? In this trying to keep up with life in the way that it's expected to be there, you know, that they're expected to be there in this way. Right. And I suspect that this is a bigger problem than we even understand. Right. That, yeah. you know, there's a lot of this. How, and in that context, why does it matter now? Like, what is really like, how could this hold women back if they continue to not, if they continue to mask, if they continue to, not accept that there might be a neuroatypical way of being in the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, in my experience and observation, it has a lot to do with um, not offering your gifts for one thing. You know, I mean, we usually have something inside us that is really special and maybe, you know, um, positive in the extreme if we could allow it to be, or if we could allow it to be seen, maybe we're you know, I'm a really, really good 
problem solver, you know, and I, everything is a puzzle to me. And I do puzzles constantly, like in the background, you know, my brain is constantly working that way. And so being put in situations where there are puzzles to solve that I care about, I don't tend to care, um, solve a lot of puzzles I don't care about, but <laughs> if I care about it. So, I mean, the fact that we can care so deeply about, you know, the things that we care about and that we, our brains can tell stories, see images, um, you know, solve problems in ways that the other people around us can't, we have something really to bring. And if we're just constantly trying to blend in or figure out how to hold still or not be overly expressive or not be overly direct or whatever it is that we're trying not to be, we're also not being that. We're also not being that amazing problem solver or empath or support person or um, you know, artist or mathematician or, you know creator, dancer, whatever we could be. We're not being that if we're all of our energy is focused on trying, you know, not to rock the boat, not to trigger bullying, you know, and I think that's probably true for women in general and any, you know, like accomplished woman and, uh, you know, especially women that work in um, predominantly male fields like I do. And then neurotypical women are just like, it's even, you know, an extra thing of, um, you know, just the, the physical body, you know, and facial expressions and tone of voice and things like that that have to constantly be monitored. <laughs> well, and, you, and you mentioned some of those things in, in your story, that the tools that you've learned how to bring into your life so that you can be fully who you are while also being in this puzzle solving in the world moment, right? Would you like to, to tell us a few of the tools that sure. you have found really helpful? Sure. So I'll preface this by saying that nothing ever makes it go away or totally better. There are things that just make it easier or more relaxed or, you know, more functional. Um, the best one for me, of course, is going out in nature and just spending time in the woods, walking and noticing things. It's the only time that my anxiety or my, you know, like um, sort of negative self-awareness goes away, you know, it just dissipates and, you know, I just feel um, relaxed and joyful and, um, you know, connected. So that's, that's the main one that I use. And, you know, I also use meditation and yoga and some breathing exercises and that sort of thing, which always help, you know, calm your physiology or breathing, whatever is happening with your body in the moment. But in terms of like interacting with other people, what helps the most is learning about self-awareness, other awareness, and self-management. So like the going in the forest, doing yoga, the breathing, all that kind of stuff is self-management. It helps me to calm down, understand and tolerate what's going on with my body and my feelings, um, you know, which is important for all of us, you know, but someone who has really heightened experience of those things, um, experiences feelings as, you know, physical pain, experiences sounds and sights as physical pain. It's really, helpful to be able to manage that, you know, to be able to function in the world and not put it on other people or act out toward other people, be very reactive toward other people, you know, easily irritated by them, all those things that can happen. But people, you know, often find their experience to be with neurotypical people. You know? <laughs> maybe they snap at them or maybe they suddenly walk away or, you know, that sort of thing. And so, understanding how you know to be with myself and my feelings and help myself be in a place where I can tolerate that experience of you know other people's voices and sounds and you know loud chewing whatever it is that happens when you're in a space with other people and um, then there's the the self-awareness which is you know that I can be you know I can be very talkative. I can interrupt people if I'm excited about some what I'm talking about. I can tune other people out when I'm really interested in what I'm doing. I can be overly direct, you know. 
I can be so excited and interested in my vision and my puzzles and things like that, that I'm not um, taking into account what other people, you know, are saying. Most people don't have this experience of me. Most people I would say, you know, that I would listen really, really well, that I'm a really, really good listener that I really pay attention to what's going on with other people, that I'm always thinking of people who are not here. And, you know, that's a conscious thing. That's because I have taken care of myself emotionally. I've gone into the situation with the intention of being receptive to the other people, listening to understand and not listening to respond or to solve their problems. And, you know, also reminding myself that the best way to solve a puzzle is to have all the pieces. And listening to other people is what gives you all the pieces. And so that's a big motivation for me is I can solve the puzzle if I have all the pieces. And so it's important to listen to what everybody says, even if they don't like what each other are saying, even if there's some like yelling or arguing or, you know, that sort of thing, I can kind of like tune that out or decide I don't really care a whole lot about it because I'm going to get the information that I want. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's a, a good thing that I've learned probably in the last five years. Um, and then the other awareness, you know, just paying attention to the other people and, you know, realizing, you know, that they could be, um, they could be a person who doesn't care a whole lot about other people's feelings. And that used to upset me. I couldn't believe it. Like, how can you not care about other people's feelings? How can you not care about what's going on with other people? And there are people who just don't. And their way of communicating is just to blurt out whatever's going on with them. And I used to just get, you know, I mean, it was just like slings and arrows all the time to me, you know, and people say, you need to develop a thicker skin. And I was like, I don't know how, I, you know, I don't have thicker skin. I you don't grow skin that's thicker and not have these things hurt you. And um, it's helpful for me to realize, to separate it out and realize like that's their way of being and their neurodistinctness. And I need to not receive it in a way that is hurtful to me. Like I can just put it here and say, like essentially label them or put them in a box in a way, a person who has this communication style that is more direct, that, you know, is focused on the outcome that doesn't really care about people's feelings. And the sooner I stop, I focus, I listen to their short thing that they're going to say, the sooner I can get out of the situation, the sooner I have the information I need, you know, the clearer it is for me just to respond to them that way. <laughs> You know, and when other people get their feelings hurt, I can say, hey, don't worry about it. It's just their communication style. Like, what information did you get out of it and how can we use it? Um, so that's been hugely helpful. As much as I don't like to be put in a box, putting people in boxes that way has been really helpful. Well, but because you've been put in the box, right? Like in the over the course of your lifetime, and and you you write about that and how your experience in school was a surprise to some extent right and yeah as you talk a little bit about that younger child that younger Wendy who who was put in a box and labeled I'd like you to also show how you took your daughter out of a box right and your own children mm. like because yeah your story very much shows this really dynamic connection with your daughter as well and um you being a mom and wanting to help her but also coming at it from this, you know, like you say, the hologram in your mind, right? The the way yeah. that puzzles solve and see things. So talk a little bit about like Wendy, who was put in the box into like where you are in the spiral path now and one or two highlights along the way, particularly with your daughter. That's um... Yeah, so, um, you know, as I write about, I mean, we moved a lot, so I went to a lot of different schools, and so it was kind of like a reset every single time, but it kind of just had this rhythm of showing up, being really quiet, them not, you know, them trying to draw me out, then when they do, they find out that I'm just way, way, way too advanced for what they're doing, and they can't really deal with that, and that's too much for them, and so there's this dichotomy of like, you know, kid who doesn't speak, you know, is extremely, extremely well behaved, but doesn't really interact, don't know what to do with her. Oh, no, when she talks, she overwhelms everybody with information and is, you know, you know, way beyond, you know, what we can handle with our curriculum and what's going on. And, and so we'll send her to the library. You know, we'll send her somewhere, somewhere with a workbook or something, usually math, to teach herself. 
And, um, you know, when I was in high school, it ended up being, you know, I'm just going to take the high school equivalency test and go to college because, you know, I actually had been taking college classes since, since I was 13 because they gave me some IQ test and it qualified me for some, you know, program and they started sending me to college classes. And, um, and so I was just like, I might as well just stop high school because, I mean, it's just a social thing that makes no sense to me. I don't understand it whatsoever. And I might as well just stop it and go to go to college. And um, so I took a high school equivalency test. And then the adults in my life, this happened multiple times where they were, a teacher would be like, put her ahead. We need her to put ahead two grades. And, and they wouldn't do it. My parents wouldn't do it because socially it was already hard enough for me. And then you put me with older kids. It was just going to be a disaster in their opinion. I wasn't going to be able to handle it. And so they did that again in high school. And so what they ended up doing was making me editor of the yearbook and then letting me spend half my day in the the photography studio and so I was just you know making art and taking pictures and you know just spending you know soaking myself in, in photography chemicals you know all day and that's what I I did and so I just decided that school was a complete waste of time and it was basically free childcare, and not not good child care you know I mean like maybe I was safe but in a lot of situations I was bullied and you know i had migraines and things like this from bullies you know who were not not great and um so it was just it was just a bad experience for me i mean the only things i liked were sometimes my teachers and i rarely had friends you know i was mostly friends with my sister and i had two friends in my life that were really close friends that i'm still friends with that loved really loved me you know um and one of them could still get you know in the girl weirdness you know so um you know that was my experience and that's what school was like and when I found out I was pregnant um and that I was going to have my own child and I was pretty sure it was going to be a daughter I just I couldn't do it I couldn't do it to her and I just knew you know she went to kindergarten because my partner you know didn't understand homeschooling and didn't you know thought I was being overly protective and her experience was so bad you know I mean she was way ahead and the teacher anytime I said like she needs more stimulation the teacher would accuse me of pressuring her which I wasn't my daughter was coming to me and saying you know my teacher made me the assistant for the class and um you know my teacher sent me to this other class to help kids with math you know that kind of thing and I just went you know, I, I just can't, I can't do it. And so I took her out of school and we started just having adventures together. I, I got the state standards and I just started in, we started inventing math and inventing, you know, projects, um, you know, she did photo essays, you know, and journal articles and she hated writing. She could write, you know, an essay when she was five years old and she hated it. She would not do it. And I just had to keep it in myself. Like, I know she can do it. And when she has something she feels inspired to write about, she will. And she hated it. And, you know, for years and years, she would not write, absolutely would not write. And I would just have to hold in myself. I know she knows how to do it. You know, I have evidence. She can do it. She knows how to do it. And I'm not going to force her to do it. And, um, then she started writing these, she wanted to write um, science journals and she would research an animal, draw a beautiful detailed picture of it and then write a description of it. I still have these and, you know, she did maybe about six one year, um, you know, and, and that was something that came out of her. And I just think like, I don't think as a teacher, I could have come up with such a cool, you know, Thing for her to do and it was just like this you know with the math and I you know she was obsessed with um ancient civilization western civilization and so like the Egyptians and the Romans and so she wanted to do all of her she was doing algebra you know she she did two math books a year you know and she was just like so advanced and you know by the time she was 10 you know I I mentioned you know my dad teaching me his calculus homework I didn't know that's what was happening but him teaching me his calculus homework when I was 10. And I was thinking, I don't, I really don't want my 10 year old to be in calculus. This is not, you know, like she's, you know, it's not useful to be a 10 year old, you know? 
And so, um, you know, I, I got to a point where I just decided that art was as important as any other thing. They were all equal. It wasn't like reading and writing, you know, and arithmetic was more important than art and dance and things like that. She started doing circus arts. She started doing all kinds of dance. She started directing shows and, you know, teaching people, making incredible costumes. I mean, she just has like, you know, this whole part of herself where she makes costumes and, and characters and directs circus art shows. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that she could do with the freedom and the support, you know, and I needed to then start making enough money to pay for those lessons, you know, which I did, but, um, you know, I mean, that's the kind of thing that can come out of a person when they're allowed and supported and not, you know, put in this box and, you know, made to go to school. And then if they don't fit in the right box for the school, just like ostracized, you know, and, and probably abused. <laughs> well, and, and I'll definitely invite the readers because it's such a touching, there's like a lot of touching moments with you and your daughter. And, and you could see how how your experience has influenced her experience and now she's she's thriving and and doing you know amazing things out in the world and you too i mean look at you ba in dance ms in soil science phd in forest engineering right this is this is important work that you're doing and tell us now like where you are on your spiral path you know how are you how where are you going from here? What's next? Um, what's next for me is is kind of just being where I am and being happy with that. I've come back to um, the forest where I used to work. I've come back to the forest service I, after an absence and a lot of traveling. And, um, you know, being in a place where I've been before, I think that's that spiral path thing and the thing that Sarah talks about in her intro um, essay is, um, you know, this coming back to the same place and being there and really contemplating it and how different you are. And the place is the same and maybe it changes in some ways, but really it's you who are different, you know, each time you return there. And so, um, you know, Come when I was here before, I was pretty much scared all the time. You know, I was overwhelmed. I was scared. I had people in my life that I was constantly trying to make happy or impress or get to not hurt me. <laughs> and um, and I was always, you know, feeling in over my head, even though I was excelling. You know, and so I was having this, which is not uncommon for me. I have this dichotomy of like being completely bored and understimulated and not and trying to find something new to do and also feeling um, in over my head overwhelmed. So it's like bored with the mental stuff and and the mental stimulation and not being there and then completely overwhelmed with the interpersonal, you know, communication, politics, having to be present with people and like the social structure. And that's how I was feeling. And, um, you know, leaving and having a remote job, doing something totally corporate, um, where I had to basically learn something new all the time, every day. Um, and I was completely disconnected from my people, this community, you know, my mission, um, conservation, you know, the things that I'm passionate about and just working. It actually has given me a huge amount of insight and perspective and a, a break, you know, just a much needed break from the things that were triggering me all the time and the people. And now I'm coming back and the people have had an experience without me as well. And so the gratitude, the outpouring of gratitude is unbelievable in both directions like i'm grateful to be here and i'm happy to see them and just their gratitude to have me back that i came back that you know their experience whatever experience they were having when i wasn't there they're going to stop having <laughs> that it's going to be positive they're going to get help and support they're going to get what they need um 
is amazing. It's really, really incredible. And also I have so many tools, you know, and I do have more of that ability just to be like, that person is that way. Let them be that way. Like that's their narrow distinctness, whether they realize it or not. And um, I think that's something that is special that more mature people or people who at least know that they are your neuro unique and what their you know neuro uniqueness is and what it does for them and how they can help manage it. It's a gift because we can actually see that everybody's neuro unique. You know, we're just more aware of it because we need to be, you know, because it's heightened in some ways for us. But we can see everybody's uniqueness, and therefore everybody's differences become a lot easier to deal with. Everybody's different. So if you're dealing with people or you're interacting with them. You know, you got to adapt and adjust and like not take them personally, just kind of find them, you know, intriguing or curious or, you know, um, you know, a challenge in their own ways, but not, you know, something to be afraid of or, you know, offensive or something to be managed, you know. So that's where, that's the perspective I'm coming back to and people, you know, are, asking me if I if I was happy to be home and things like that you know it's funny because I didn't feel like I was coming home I felt like I was coming to a new place actually my next adventure and um that I was coming to it with so much perspective and wisdom and not in a way that I needed to just come in tell people how it's going to be like now I have all the answers I'm totally wise I'm going to tell you what it's like and how you need to be but the opposite to just realize like I sort of have a responsibility as a person who's been through this and has managed it and has come through to this place and has, you know, walked that path, you know, and learned the things and had had the really hard experiences that I'm a person who has come to this place right now and who has all of that perspective that just needs to be present and make that available to the people who haven't done it yet. Such yeah. a good point. <laughs> and it, it is, right? And, and it brings right to the next sort of ties in perfectly because you are bringing this new perspective in. What are five qualities that it takes to walk a spiral path? Well, the main quality is taking one step after another. I mean, that's literally what walking is, right? Just showing up and taking each step. That's the main thing that it always takes, no matter what else is happening. And then I think it's self-love. And I, I don't mean this in a narcissistic way. I mean it in a, you know, self-compassion, self-acceptance um, way of just, you know, being willing to be who you are, show up as who you are in that moment not perfect, not at the end, you know, just who I am at this step in this moment right now. And do your best to love that person. And then, you know, forgiveness. You're going to have to forgive yourself for the missteps, for the failure. You come back to same places because you're in a pattern or you're in a loop sometimes, or that's who you are or your limitations are, you're butting up against them. And once again, you know, you're having to learn the next thing that you can learn about managing those or confronting those limitations. And um, it may feel like they knock you back down to somewhere you were before, you know, that they undo all the progress that you've made. And um, when you're in that place, you know, you need to forgive yourself and just realize like I'm human humans are animals. This is my path. This is my ecosystem. And I'm just doing my best to function in it. And um, then I think it takes um, connection to yourself and to other people. And um, so the connecting with yourself, you know, is, is part of that, just sitting with yourself you know, letting your feelings be, you know, understanding that, that feelings are chemical reactions. They trigger thoughts in your brain, 
you know, if you feed them with the thoughts, you know, which is a hard thing for me, I, I can have thoughts that really, really circle. Um, and just, you know, realizing like they're temporary, you know, I mean, even if I feed them for 24 hours or something, I'm going to get exhausted, you know, eventually. And the more I can just be like, hey, feelings, okay, feelings, you know, we all have them. They're just chemical reactions. They're just something happening in my body right now. They're not going to end the world. Um, you know, that's huge. You know, because sometimes our feelings do feel like too much. And sometimes some of us do end the world over them. And relationships, you know, and jobs and all kinds of things. Because our feelings get to be too much. And if we can learn to tolerate them and be with them. Then we can keep going. And we can find one thing that is... What is the one thing that could be helpful or that I could learn from this <clears throat> or would bring more curiosity and hope to the situation? And so then uh, I think the fifth thing then is finding community, is finding people who can see you, who can let you talk like this about what's really going on with you, about your journey, about your path. You know, I'm blessed to have a partner who is also neurotypical and is you know, on a similar spiral path and spirals in different ways, but, um, you know, it's, I can really have good, deep conversations about, you know, and can really bring a different perspective to the kinds of things that I struggle with or that I wonder about or that I need to explore. And that's a really, really precious thing. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Now repeat these words. Dear reader, if there's one thing I hope you get out of my story, it's this. Dear readers, if there's one thing I hope you get out of my story, it's that we're all different, we're all unique, and we can all shine in our own ways, and there's always hope. Yes. <laughs> yes. Parting words. Any last thoughts, feelings, suggestions, ideas? Ah, um, and including what would the next step be for the reader? What would you recommend as you're kind of bringing that all together? So um, some parting words are that, you know, this sort of thing is never easy. It's never really easy to be different. It's never easy to be extreme. It's, it's not easy. And yet, so many people, so many things in our world would not happen without people like us, without people who think differently and see things differently and have, you know, just a really unique skill set. So it's important for us to be there, for us to show up. And for us to be seen and for us to keep working on the skills and the challenges and the things that help us function better around other people, especially neurotypical people who need that different perspective. And the next steps I think are, you know, if you are reading my story or you're listening to me and you're thinking like, she doesn't seem that different, you know, or, you know, she seems pretty normal to me or wait a minute. She's really, really weird, at, but I'm relating to her. <laughs> and um, maybe this experience is familiar to me. I would suggest maybe going online and um, looking up one of the tests that they have, you know, to help determine if women are on the autism spectrum, because um, there are a lot of them these days. And because all of the tests and all the diagnoses are made for the male um, brain and the male body, they are totally different. And so women tend to go undiagnosed or unnoticed. And it's, you know, you can be like, I don't want an autism diagnosis because that will give me stigma, stigma. You know, that will put me in this box that, you know, people don't want to have autistic children. People don't want to know autistic people. It, it, but for you don't have to announce it to anyone. You don't have to do what I'm doing right now. This is terrifying. But you could know it for yourself and start to accept like, oh, this is why I struggle, you know, with that. This is why I 
this is why this hurts me so much. This is why I find that so grating or annoying. This is why my body is responding to things this way. And this is why I think these amazing thoughts or I have these you know, amazing experiences that other people don't seem to be having. And those things could be a good thing. It couldn't be like, you know, instead of being like, oh my God, why am I so strange? Why do I see these things? Why do I see numbers? Why are, why do things happen in colors this way? What, you know, why are my thoughts so intense? Why do I go in a direction with an interest and get so absorbed in it? I don't notice anyone else for a while. Those could be good things. Yeah, they can be. But thank you, Wendy. Thank you for being here. Thank you for writing your story. Thanks for Thank sharing you. your story here as well. Huh?